begins quite a bit different from any of the others. How so? Doesn't begin with Harry, doesn't start from Harry's point of view. Okay? Why do you think she does that? Why start it off um, with it out being about Harry? Changes the tone of the book. Okay. Why else? Maybe gives us some information that Harry will know. Like we will, like we'll know something will happen at some point during the year because Daniel is planning something. Okay. It's true. It's also because. One through three are somewhat what's called formulaic. Right? They could fit into what is generally called formula fiction. Okay? Formula fiction, if you've never read any, um, your your kind of typical detective story. Right? What's the point of a detective story? What's single word phrase? Who done it? Who done it? Who did whatever? Whether you're reading Agatha Christie, you're, you're watching Murder, She Wrote on TV, you're reading uh, Sherlock Holmes, you're reading some Edgar Allan Poe. The idea is a crime has been committed. The job of the author is to help you figure out by the end of the novel who done it. Okay? It's very standard. All right? Romance fiction, like Harlequin novels. Okay? What always happens? Well... You can know because you can actually read, um, I can't remember the name of the actual document. It's essentially a cheat sheet for writing romance fiction. You're told the number of words to use, it's like 50 to 70,000. You're told how many heroines to have or how many male suitors. You're told what kind of activity they are to engage in and not go beyond. Okay, why? Because those are reaching a certain demographic. And that certain demographic tends to be, well, let me rephrase this, used to tend to be, okay, slightly older than middle-aged women who are wanting to kind of rekindle in their hearts slash minds some kind of experience of love. So they're reading about it in these, you know, trashy novels, essentially. Okay? How are the first three of these formulaic? They start with Harry, they end with Harry. Okay? One, two, and three, what essentially has to happen in each of them? What is Harry doing in each of them? Louder? He's learning. What else? He becomes a what on the Quidditch team in the first book? A seeker. He's seeking each of those three books. First book, he's seeking the Philosopher's Stone. Second book, Chamber of Secrets, third book, Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay, he's seeking each of those things. Okay, fourth book, is he seeking the Goblet of Fire? No, because it's set out right in front of him. So what he's seeking is not nearly as clear. Okay, they all begin at number four, Privet Drive, as I, as I already said. This one doesn't begin at number four, Privet Drive. These all with the exception of Quirrell, don't have any deaths, one through three. Again, with the exception of Quirrell. But Quirrell doesn't die, you know, some violent, horrific death. Are we actually ever told that Quirrell dies? He doesn't, you know, disappear into a bazillion specks of dust like in the film, all right? Here, you may not have gotten to it yet, we do have our first death. It's an active death. It is a murder. It's not accidental. Okay? And from this point on, bodies are going to start dropping. It's like we go from kind of a, a classical tr um, comedy, if these were plays, you go from a classical comedy where in a comedy you have um, the play begins, I'll use Shakespeare's Winter's Tale. 
which isn't quite a comedy, but it kind of works a little bit. You, you start with a society that is, at the very beginning of the play, okay, there's nothing wrong with it. And then something ruptures in society. Something starts to rip the society apart. In The Winter's Tale, if you saw that, saw it, what's the thing that rips the society apart? It's when King Leontes accuses his wife, essentially, of being a whore. Publicly. In front of everybody. Okay? He sees her pregnant belly and he says, You have mistaken Polixenes, the other king, for me. He's the one who got you pregnant. Okay? Yeah, that pretty much rips society into shreds. So then the remainder, in a, in a typical comedy, the remainder of the play is about how that rip gets sewn back together. How that society gets restored. Tragedy, you start off with everything fine, and then it all gets destroyed, and then it ends. <laughs> and the person who does the destroying dies, usually. Okay? Shakespeare. Harry Potter, you've got the comedy kind of aspect in the first three. You don't get that in the last three. Or even in this. So in the first three, we get kind of the intro to the world. We're, we're seeing Harry's introduction to the magical world, because that doesn't only begin in the first one. That continues. Okay? We see Harry's development as a character in those three books. And then this book, <coughs> I'm going to have no voice by my second class probably. Um, this book serves as a hinge or pivot between these three and these three. In other words, this book kind of flows from one through three and flows into five through six. And five through six wouldn't make any sense. Without this one. Now, five through six also wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. If you hadn't read three and hadn't read two, in other words, you can't read, you can't just pick up uh, Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince and have it completely make sense on its own. You, you really need to read them um, in order. But this, by opening it at the Riddle House, Rowling is saying, this isn't formulaic. Okay? I'm not simply following a, a sheet of suggestions. Okay? She's saying, okay, folks, you know, strap in, because now the ride's gonna get a little bit bumpier. Right? First three, or kind of especially the first one. It's relatively lighthearted, right? I mean, ooh, here he gets to help Hagrid free essentially, a dragon. I mean, who wouldn't want to have something to do with dragons? They sound fun until you get to this book and he has to steal an egg from a dragon and, you know, you find out not so fun, okay? The second book, Chamber of Secrets. Who wouldn't want to be able to discover a hidden lost chamber? I mean, Geraldo Rivera's made millions of dollars off of that, you know, finding quote-unquote lost chambers or Secret, you know, um, safes or something, okay? But then you get to this one. And what do we see first chapter? A murder. Frank Price doesn't die of a heart attack. He doesn't go, ah, whatever that thing is in the chair, and die from that. He dies from the Avada Kedavra. We've heard about people being killed before. Now we're seeing it. Why? Think of Rowling's audience, okay? which originally was probably many of you, if you got these books at about the right age. Now I take that back because you guys are all too young for that because you would be much older than probably 20 or 21. If you were 10 years old in 1997, <coughs> 20 years ago, so you'd now be 30, and you started reading these then, How old are you by the time you get to this one? How old is Harry in Goblet of Fire? 
11, 12, 13. So he's 14 here. Okay? Are 10 year olds or 11 year olds necessarily, and I know this is a lot of this is really subjective, ready for murder, ready to deal with murder? And I'm, again, I'm not talking about our real world where far too many 10 year olds and 11 year olds and 5 year olds have to deal with murder on a regular basis. I mean, think of poor kids, for example, growing up in Chicago. I mean, where you have between five to 10 murders every weekend, okay? That not counting the number of people wounded by um, gang warfare, essentially. No, so here, what is she doing? She's preparing her audience. She is, each book gets gradually a little bit darker, a little bit darker, a little bit darker. I mean, Prisoner of Azkaban, which we didn't get to discuss. Hopefully you watched the um, video lecture. What is Harry introduced to there? Or introduced to there? Maybe not personally, but in the opening chapter. What do we hear about Sirius Black in that opening chapter? Dangerous. dangerous. To put it mildly, how dangerous is he? What has he been accused of? Mass murder. Mass murder. How many muggles did he supposedly kill? Yes, like 13. This isn't your run-of-the-mill average, you know, I'm going to pop off and kill a person or two. It's not quite Las Vegas, but it's, you know, getting close, right? Turns out not to be a mass murderer. Turns out Ron's rat is the mass murderer, okay? A little weird. So... She's, she's kind of preparing us in this novel. From here on out, it's going to get darker. But what else does that mean? Is it just fantasy? He starts to show us that there's actually real issues in this book that can be handled with ours. Okay. Do we not have those real issues in one through three? We do. They're not brought as strongly to the fore as they are in this book. Or especially even in the next book. Okay? This book is published in 2000. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix is published in 2003. Right? We're going to see a lot of, for lack of a better phrase, a lot of events that occur in books five and six that kind of mimic to some extent, especially in book six, you know, what happened in, on 9-11, okay? Especially in book six, which is four years after the fact. Kind of interesting when we get to book six. You know, when book six was published, it was published about two weeks, two, about, two, about three and a half weeks after Britain experienced its own kind of mini 9-11. I say mini because fewer than 50 people died. It wasn't 3,000 like happened here. But July 5th, excuse me, July 7th, 2005, okay, you had a terrorist attack in Britain. Well, book six opens with quote unquote all these strange events. Turns out they're terrorist attacks. Who are the terrorists? Death eaters. Death eaters that are in that novel. Okay, so start with Goblet of Fire, and notice, because I don't think, I don't have my books with me, I don't remember there being table of contents with the others. There were? There were? Okay. 37 chapters, however. You go from Prisoner of Azkaban which has maybe 300 pages, to 734, okay? Something's happened. And so we start with the Riddle House. That's a quick question. Yes. The difference between the length of book between one and three and four on, did her publisher take her reins off, basically, and just give her however many words she wanted? Or was that her original plan to have much shorter books one through three and then four 
through 7 being the meat of the story? Can't answer that. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't actually know the answer to that. My own feeling, um, based more upon the length of Order of Phoenix, is that probably, and this probably applies to this, by the time this gets published, Bloomsbury slash Scholastic realize rolling is what for them? Minus. Yeah. Golden goose lays a gold egg every time, you know, kind of a thing. She's a cash register, man. I mean, they look at her and all they see are dollar signs and pound signs. Every word is seemingly gold. Again, one through three have relatively, one especially, um, not last week, two weeks ago what <coughs> was the 20th anniversary of the first publication of the first Harry Potter book. She, um, she got 1,500 pounds, and it had, where did I read that? I don't think I shared it. I think it was a 1,000 copy print run. 1,000. If you could find and buy one of those, those would be, I would guess, 100 grand, probably, for a, for a copy of that first printing. Okay. Um, second book is a little bit longer. Third book is a little bit longer. Second book is getting a little bit more advertising. Third book is getting a little, more, a little bit more advertising. Third book is, in the U.S. at least, getting radio advertising, because that's when I heard about it on NPR. Okay? By the time the third book is published and this book is in the works, you have massive advertising. I mean, well before the release date, though after the release date is announced, you already have um, Barnes & Noble and other bookstores planning release parties, midnight release parties. It's the first time in history a book has ever been released and for sale at 12.01 a.m. No, nobody has stayed up before to go to a bookstore at midnight to get a copy of a book. Okay? This one they do. And I think one of the reasons it's so much longer is... Partially because they didn't want to cut any words out because they realized people are going to buy this thing, really no matter how long it is. If, if she had written book seven, a thousand pages, I think it would have sold as many, if not more, copies because people would go, ooh, there's more to drool over, you know, like another 250 pages of just the epilogue. It's kind of what... Harry Potter and the Cursed Child is. <laughs> Don't buy it. <coughs> it's absolutely horrible. From students, however, um, when I was in London in spring of, summer of 2016 when the play came out, students who saw the play said it works as a play. One of the reasons for that is you're not paying as close attention to the writing. The writing my dog could do better than. It is horrible. <laughs> right, I mean, I couldn't finish it. I got 50 pages in and wanted to use it for toilet paper, essentially. It's, man, it is so bad. It's like fan fiction. Yeah. Not even Lil Yeah, it's bad fan fiction. I mean, it's like eight-year-old fan fiction. I mean, it is trite is, is too high a praise um, for it. You hear about it, like people talking about how bad it is, and you're like, it can't be that bad. That was my opinion. I bought it and I was like, oh my god, it's that bad. So it's, well, this is, didn't James Lamar actually want to be Supposedly. She didn't write it. She didn't write it. She had oh, influence in the writing. Oh, that's she, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, the text is approved by her. So they wrote it and she can't kind of she gave it her what's called her imprimatur. Her this is approved by but think of why she isn't why she would not do that. If she doesn't do that, it's not gonna sell. And it's 
J.K. Rowling at the top. Not, I have no idea even who the two guys' authors, who their names are. Um, anyways, so we start with chapter one, The Riddle House. And we're not going to go into all the details because um, I do actually want to try to get up pretty far. But what do we see in this chapter? Why is it significant? What's it, what's it leading to later on in the novel? Voldemort's back. Voldemort's back. Is he back back at this point? Mm -hmm. How is he described? Sickly looking child slash reptilian lizard person thing. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Baby, like a baby. Okay. Kept in swaddling clothes, essentially. You know, he can sit in a chair and he has hands because he can wave a wand. And he's not a baby in that all he does is babble. He can speak, okay? But he has to be fed. How is he fed? By Nagini's milk. Snakes don't have breasts, so where do you get snake milk from? Fangs. Get a jar, push it up against the back side of the fangs where their venom sacs are, and do that several times, and the venom comes out. So he drinks, he drinks snake venom. Well, we've already seen him drink what? Unicorn blood. So, you know, how much worse can snake venom be after that? Okay. So what are he and Wormtail debating when Frank Price overhears the conversation? And notice, it kind of is a debate. What does Wormtail not want to do? Louder. Okay, he doesn't, yeah, he wants to leave, but what else? He doesn't want to kidnap Harry. Why? Keep going. Why is that a bad idea? He's too well protected. So what does Wormtail want to do instead? Get somebody else. I mean, we're not told what they need Harry for till almost the end of the novel. But we are told needs to be an enemy. Okay, so who does that include in the wizarding world for Voldemort? Yeah, just about everybody is considered an enemy. Okay, what does Voldemort think is Wormtail's motivation for not using Harry? Sentiment? Because Harry saved his life. So Harry, according to Voldemort, um, Wormtail kind of owes Harry something. Okay, and Wormtail says, not at all. The boy means nothing to me. Okay. We'll see. Look at page nine. They're talking about Harry, and Voldemort says, I could use another wizard. That is true. Wormtail. My lord, it makes sense. Look at the next two words that Wormtail says. Or three words, if you want. Laying hands on Harry would be so difficult. What does he mean, laying hands on Harry? Isn't that strange? A strange locution? Isn't that weird verbiage for, what does he really mean? Okay. I mean, he does mean that, but to what purpose? Taking him. You're getting ready to kidnap somebody. Do you say, well, I'm going to go lay hands on him? No, you say, kidnapping. Kidnapping Harry Potter would be so difficult. He is a kid, and you are napping him. Napping in this sense means taking. Okay? Why not just say kidnapping him? Why does it have the same effect? Okay. The of laying hands. Bingo! It's exactly what I was looking for. Laying hands on has a religious connotation. 
specifically a Christian religious connotation. What does it connote? Within the New Testament, it connotes healing. Healing. Okay. St. James says in the book of James, somebody is sick in your congregation, get all the deacons and elders together and lay hands on and pray for that person. Now, is Wormtail suggesting they lay hands on and pray for Harry? No. They are suggesting they lay hands on and pray on other kind of pray, like a praying mantis, which both, you know, looks like its arms are like this, but what is it doing? It's getting ready to pray on, to jump on something else, okay? Will, quote unquote, healing take place from laying hands on Harry? Yes, but not for Harry. Rather than infusing power into Harry, Voldemort is going to take power from Harry. Okay? So, Frank Bryce overhears all this, and they kill him. Or Voldemort kills him. And Harry wakes up. Whatever that bug was, I think it got me. Um, Vol uh, Voldemort wakes up. Harry wakes up, and his scar is hurting. He doesn't know why his scar is hurting, but he does know every other time his scar is hurt before, Voldemort's got something to do with it. Okay? And hopefully you also watch the video on Chamber of Secrets because of what it tells us about Harry's scar and such. Um, so Harry sits there in his bedroom and he starts to think, tries to think, well, what would my friend say about the reason for my scar hurting? And he plays in his mind Hermione. Ooh, that's really serious. This is page 21. Write to Dumbledore, and I'll go look in a book. Hermione, solution to every problem found in a book. Okay? So he thinks, what kind of letter would he write to Dumbledore? Dear Professor Dumbledore, sorry to bother you. My scar hurt this morning. Sincerely, Harry Potter. Lame. Okay? He thinks of Ron, then. Hmm, your scar hurt. Top of 22. But you know who can't be near you now, can he? I mean, you'd know, wouldn't you? He'd be trying to do you in again, wouldn't he? Always run, look on the bright side of things, you know. Voldemort's there to kill you. Let me ask Dad. Yeah, like his dad, who works in what department? At the ministry? Misuse of muggle artifacts, like outlets. Ooh, he's really going to understand why he's scarred. No. So he thinks of Sirius. That's it. I'll write to Sirius. Because he's in contact with Sirius now that Sirius is free, but not legally free. So he writes him a letter. Page 25. Says, um, Weird thing happened this morning. My scar hurt again. Last time that happened, it was because Voldemort was at Hogwarts. I don't reckon he can be anywhere near me now, can he? Question mark. Do you know if cursed scars sometimes hurt years afterwards? What's the problem with that question about cursed scars? Especially in Harry's context. Nobody's ever had one. Yeah, nobody's ever had one. Because usually somebody of Avada Kedavra's you, you're dead. It's, it's not like you're mostly dead and then you come back. Okay? So he sends the letter off. Next chapter, the invitation, we find out some things are going on in Dudley's life, and they get a letter from the Weasleys for Harry to come to the Quidditch World Cup. So what's going on with Dudley? He's on a diet. He's on a diet. Why? The school was said he's too big to fit in his clothes. Okay, he's too big to fit in his clothes. He's described as the size of a baby killer whale. Okay? So, he's on a diet. Book five begins, by the way, the diet has worked. The training regimen that um, Aunt Petunia has put Dudley under has worked. Why? Because he's now the Southeast Boxing Champion of England. 
He's no longer the size of a small killer whale. He's like a 17, uh, 16 year old Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's put on a lot of meat and he beats up people. When that book begins, how old is the people he's beating up? 10. Okay? He's 16. He's beating up 10 year olds. Okay. So, the Weasleys show up. Um, in Back to the Burrow. Let's see here. They show up late, which, you know, the Dursleys are, like, real put out by that. I mean, punctuality, apparently, is something to them. They do ask Harry, are they coming the normal way? Which to the Dursleys means what? Car? Harry, uh, maybe. <laughs> he doesn't know really how they're coming. And bottom of 42, top of 43, we hear the Weasleys arrive. by voices and loud noises in their living room wall inside the block fireplace. We hear Fred and George and Mr. Weasley. And then we see, I've never noticed that before. Page 43, we have our, I think, could be wrong. I think it's our first instance of swearing. Mr. Weasley says, damn. Why? Because he's blocked up in a wall. What on earth did they want to block up the fireplace for? For Harry says, they've got an electric fire. And Mr. Weasley, you know, goes all weird because he's excited. So what does he do to the blocked up fireplace that they are inside? <laughs> you know, blows a freaking hole in the wall. So now the Dursley's living room is covered with plaster and dust. Okay. Page 44. They walk out and he sees Mr. and Mrs. Dursley. Tall, thin, and balding, he moved toward Uncle Vernon, his hand outstretched, but Uncle Vernon backed away several places, dragging out Petunia. Words utterly failed Uncle Vernon. Okay, can you blame him? His best suit was covered in white dust, which had settled in his hair and mustache and made him look as though he'd just aged 30 years. Mr. Weasley, er, yes, sorry about that. Really? Is that going to handle it? Sorry about that? It's all my fault. Didn't just didn't occur to me we wouldn't be able to get out at the other end. Okay. So he says, don't worry, I can put it right in a jiffy. Okay. He can make the wall okay. What about Vernon and Petunia's up here? Now they could use an Obliviate charm, as we didn't get to talk about it, but as we saw with um, Chamber of Secrets Lockhart. Okay? He does it to himself, uses Ron's wand, but you know, it's another matter. We are going to see people use the Obliviate charm, or Obliviate if you want, charm on muggles without muggles ascent. In the seventh book, Hermione wipes her parents' memories so that they don't know that they have a daughter. She doesn't get approval from the Ministry of Magic for doing that. Right? We see this happen multiple times. Kind of raises some questions about wizarding treatment of muggles, okay? And what about my right to what's up here kind of a thing? We'll talk about that more later. So they go get Harry's stuff, and then they get ready to leave. Page 48. George goes through the flu. Ron says, see it to Harry. He goes through. So all that remain are Harry and Mr. Weasley. And Harry says, well, bye then. They didn't say anything at all. Harry moved toward the fire, but just as he reached the edge of the hearth, Mr. Weasley put out a hand and held him back. He was looking at the Dursleys in amazement. Harry said goodbye to you. Didn't you hear him? 
Harry, it doesn't matter. Why does Harry say it doesn't matter? He's used to it. And? Yeah. Okay. Do you also think to Harry it really doesn't matter? Like, please, can we just leave? Yes. Because he gets to spend the rest of the summer with the Weasleys. Any time away from number four Privet Drive is like, you know, Christmas for Harry. Uh, honestly, I don't care. Mr. Weasley does not remove his hand. <coughs> this is the fireplace. Harry's like, can we just go, <laughs> please? Uncle Vernon's, excuse me, you aren't going to see your nephew till next summer. Notice what Arthur is assuming. Harry's not going home for Christmas break, and he's not going home for Easter break. Okay? Which is what both those breaks, by the way, are called in all seven of the novels. They're never called winter break. They're never called spring break. Okay? You aren't going to see your nephew till next summer. He said to Uncle Vernon in mild indignation, Surely you're going to say goodbye. What does he mean by surely? Say goodbye. Yeah, that's exactly what he means. Say goodbye to your nephew. Right? What is Arthur assuming here? That Sirius actually care about Harry. Okay, that's possible. That the Dursleys do actually care about Harry. What else? Okay, that they have some common decency. Which is another way of mentioning they have manners or they show or practice courtesy. It is just good manners to say, see you later. Okay? Now look at the next paragraph. Uncle Vernon's face worked furiously. Okay, that implies. His muscles are doing something, and his face is going through different contortions. The idea of being taught consideration by a man who had just blasted away half his living room wall seemed to be causing him intense suffering. You know, like, wait, you're trying to teach me manners? Look at... But Mr. Weasley's wand was still in his hand. And Uncle Vernon's tiny eyes darted to it once before he said, Goodbye then. See you, says Harry, putting one foot forward and going off. Okay. Just before Mr. Weasley does, Dudley picks up one of the toffees and eats it, and, you know, tongue swells out. So he has to fix that. Then he has to go into the flu and fix the wall. Okay? But when he does that, the Dursleys are left how? Is Vernon still left covered in dust? Or when he fixes the wall, does everything return to how it was? I think he said everything returns to how it was. Except up here. <laughs> Their memories. Okay? So why did Arthur, let's use the language of the narrator, Teach consideration to Vernon and Petunia. Because the Weasleys are decent people. Okay. Why else? I mean, yes, I think you're right. Weasleys are decent people. Because they care about Harry. Okay, because the Weasleys care about Harry. We're going to see in this book, wasn't in the reading for today, but we in the reading for Thursday. They, you have a scene where they have the weighing of the wands, where the champions have got to get their wands weighed and measured, essentially. And one's family can show up for that. Okay? So we're going to see Crumbs, not family, but his headmaster. We're going to see Fleur Delacour's headmistress. I think actually her family does show up. Uh, Cedric's father is going to show up. Harry, he's got no family. Mrs. Weasley shows up, showing, yes, you do, Harry. Here's another reason. This is rolling teaching. 
She's teaching her readers these. Okay. We're going to see this kind of thing from this point on repeatedly. We're going to see it especially when Dumbledore goes to pick up Harry in book six. Okay. He's going to talk to the Weasleys about common courtesy and decency. Okay. So I think it's an aspect. Just one second, you go. It's an aspect of what Rowling is trying to do in all the novels. She's not merely entertaining. She's trying to teach her readers. Thinking of her readers, initially at least, as being those who pick up the novels when they're about 10 or so. Whether that, that was in 1997 or a 10-year-old in 2017. Okay? Dursleys, yeah, teaching the Dursleys, common decency. Okay, so Harry then gets to go back to the burrow. Compare the burrow with number four, Privet Drive. The burrow is actually a lot more messier, and not as um, uh, uh, pristine like the Dursleys say, like everything. It's obviously lived in by people. It's a lived by how many people? Lots of people. Nice people. Large family. As opposed to number four, Privet Drive, which is only supposed to have how many children? It's only supposed to have one because the Dursleys never wanted more than one. All right? And everything in number four, Privet Drive, is in its place. It's pristine. The kitchen is described in a couple of different places as sterile, okay? like an operating room. Kitchen in the burrow, it's got knives flying through the air. You know. So Harry gets there. Fred and George get in trouble because of uh, Weasley's Weasley's wizard Weezies. I can never say that. He sees Percy, and how has Percy developed from? The first book when we see him to this book. Remember when we first kind of see Percy in the first book. He's the one who says when Harry is sorted, we got Potter. Okay. Second and third books, where do we see Percy in Flourish and Blots? Anybody remember? He's, uh, He's reading a book about prefects title. Prefects who gained power. Okay. And one of the brothers says, yeah, it's Purse, all right. He's all about power. You know, he wants to be minister of magic. Okay. Well, we're going to see that develop. Because in this book, what is Percy? Excuse me. Third book, what is Percy? Head boy. Head boy. Second book, he's a prefect. Okay. Now, where is he? Working at the Ministry of Magic. What kind of position? Assistant to the head, to the minister? Starting out, entry level job. Working for Barty Crouch. Okay? What does Barty Crouch do? Yeah, and what's purse, you know, apparently all worked up about throughout. Okay. He's writing a report about it, and he's also writing about cauldron, cauldron bottom thicknesses. Because, you know, we're just getting a lot of cheap foreign knockoff stuff that don't have proper bottom thicknesses. And they're like, wow, so important. So, <laughs> wait. Department of Misuse of Muggle Artifacts, you know. Kind of like father, like son. But does Mr. Weasley want to gain power? He's where he is. Why? Because he he's happy. <laughs> he gets to play around with muggle stuff all day long. Okay? So we hear about, we meet um, Bill and Charlie there. Chapter 6, we get the port key. Okay? They've got to go over to um, 
auto reset catch pull, I think it is, to catch the port key. We're being told, you know, the Quidditch World Cup is a huge organizational nightmare. You know, they got to find a big open plot of land, first of all, where they can even set up the uh, pitch and all that kind of stuff. Page 71. Uh, yeah, 71. We meet Amos Diggory, Cedric's father. Okay. And we find out Amos works for the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. What do we know about them? Where have we heard about them? Uh, they were in charge of what he's like, um, uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, yeah, his so-called trial, his, his show trial, his, you know, Soviet trial, essentially. When, when Buckbeak was quote-unquote brought up on charges, was there ever any doubt as to the outcome? No, of course not. Okay. So we get introduced to him, and they all look at Cedric, and you know, hi, Cedric. B bottom of 71. Everybody said hi except Fred and George, who merely nodded. They had never quite forgiven Cedric for beating their team, Gryffindor, in the first Quidditch match of the previous year. How did Cedric beat them in the previous year? Harry, why did Harry fall off his broom? Getting, was he really attacked by them? No, they were just down there doing their Dementor stuff. And it was Harry that kind of freaked. Okay. So, page 72. Uh, Amos realizes who is in this group. Merlin's beard. Harry? Harry Potter? Yeah. Harry's used to people looking curiously at him. Seds talked about you, of course, said Amos Diggory. Told us all about playing against you last year. I said to him, I said, Sed, that'll be something to tell your grandchildren that will. You beat Harry Potter. Did he beat Harry Potter? No, no Harry Potter lost all on his own, essentially. <laughs> okay? Harry couldn't think of any reply to this, so he remained silent. Fred and George, however, are scowling. Cedric looked slightly embarrassed. This is important because it tells us something about Cedric's character that you don't get necessarily from the previous books. Harry fell off his broom, Dad. I, I told you it was an accident. Yes, but you didn't fall off, did you, son? In other words, well, we obviously can tell who is a better flyer. <laughs> Always modest, Ar said, always the gentleman. But the best man won. I'm sure Harry'd say the same, wouldn't you, eh? One falls off his broom, one stays on. Don't need to be a genius to find out which one's the better flyer. Okay? So when we get to the first task and we hear Ludo Bagman say through the PA system, my God, he can fly. What are we meant to believe? Yeah, we know which one's the better flyer. And if there hadn't been 100 Dementors around, the snitch would have been in Harry's hand. Okay? Well, what does this tell us about Cedric? Okay. Yeah, he doesn't like his father bragging about him. And it's because he's humble. He is as Amos says, modest. Amos? No. No modesty. Why? What do too many parents try to do? I want you to do this. Why? Because it'll make me feel better. <laughs> you become a doctor. Why? Because I'm not. <laughs> or a lawyer or some other, you know, profession. Okay? And catch the little... Um, it's not really foreshadowing. It's kind of ironic foreshadowing of this will be something to tell your grandchildren about. Yeah. Don't say anything. Um, <laughs> so they take the port key and they go off to the Quidditch World Cup. And what happens? We see, for example, they get their tent set up and such. And page 81... 
their fellow campers were starting to wake up. First to stir were the families with small children. Why? Because the little kids won't sleep. Harry had never seen witches and wizards, witches and wizards this young before. A tiny boy no older than two was crouched outside a large pyramid-shaped tent, holding a wand and pointing happily at a slug in the grass, which was swelling slowly to the size of a salami. As they drew level with him, his mother came hurrying out of the tent. How many times, Kevin, you don't touch Daddy's wand? Because what is little Kevin doing with the slugs? Can you just point a wand at a slug and the slug will get big? No. What do you have to do? Hagrid, third book, pumpkins. An engorgement charm makes the pumpkins bigger. Okay? Kevin's two years old. He could probably not even say engorgio. <laughs> and yet he's making these things swell up. Harry and Ron, not Hermione, Harry and Ron, first lessons using a wand, how much are they able to do? Not yeah, it's a nice way of saying nothing. And yet two-year-old Kevin can do an engorgement charm. Five-year-old George or Fred can turn Ron's teddy bear into a living, wriggling spider. See, there's a problem in the laws of her physical world that she creates. They're not uniform. Because we are told, in order to direct and focus magic, you have to have a wand. But the wand chooses the wizard. How well, for those of you who know, and don't give specifics, but how well later on, let's say book seven, is Harry able to do magic with Hermione's wand? Not very well. Okay? So how can Kevin do this with Daddy's wand? And whose wand do Fred and George use to turn Ron's teddy bear into a spider? See, that's an example. Those are examples of just bad writing, where she hasn't thought through all the particulars of her little world. Okay? It's not bad storyteller. Storyteller, she's up there at the tops. Writing in terms of taking that story and making sure all the little threads are nicely woven into the tapestry, she's not as careful about. Okay? So we go on and we see Victor Crumb. Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. Um, we're running to Oliver Wood. We see Cho Chang again. Please, someone just kill her now. Um, <laughs> sorry. <for> <coughs> uh, none of that I want to speak about. We meet Ludo Bagman. Says he's looking for Barty Crouch. And let's pick up with the chapter, the Quidditch World Cup. Which we're not going to actually talk about the World Cup itself. I do want to talk a little bit about what happens just before the Quidditch World Cup. They get up to their seats, top of the stands. Harry sees a house elf, and what does he say? Dobby. Dobby? Why? Because apparently they all look alike. Okay? And Winky says, My name is Winky, sir. And you say you're surely Harry Potter. Harry, yes, I am. Dobby speaks of you all the time, sir. How would Winky know Dobby speaks of him all the time? Where is Dobby at this point? Free elf. Okay. Is he a free elf? He's gone to work for Dumbledore at Hogwarts. Do we're going to be told repeatedly house elf magic is not wizard magic. So are house elves in different locations somehow able to communicate? We don't know. Maybe she's explained it in part. Okay, so Harry says, how is he? Oh, sir, 
Well, so many, no disrespect, sir, but I was not sure you did, Dobby, a favor, sir, when you said it. Harry, what's, what's wrong? Freedom is going to Dobby's head, sir. Ideas above his station. Can't get another position. Meaning, Dobby can't become what? Enslaved. Okay. Why? He wants pay for his work. Okay, now think about this. What's a house elf going to do with pay? Louder? Buy socks. <laughs> Buy socks. <laughs> Buy a nice shirt. Get rid of the snot rag. Essentially, yeah. Okay. House elves is not paid, sir. No, no, no. I says to Dobby, go find yourself a nice family. Settle down, Dobby. Getting up to all sorts of hijinks, etc., etc. Harry, it's about time he had a bit of fun. House elves are not supposed to have fun, Harry Potter. What do we see? I can't ask that question. I'll wait. Um, so, Winky's sitting there, and then who comes up? Who does Cornelius Fudge lead up to the top box seats? Lucius Malfoy and family. Bottom of 100, top of 101. Harry and Draco Malfoy had been enemies ever since their very first journey to Hogwarts. A pale boy with a pointed face and white blonde hair, Draco greatly resembled his father. Excuse me, his mother was blonde too, tall and slim. She would have been nice looking if she hadn't been wearing a look that suggested there was a nasty smell under her nose. In other words, her face is always what? Pinched. She always walks around like this. Okay. Ah, oh, fudge, says Malfoy. How are you? I don't think you've met my wife. Narcissa. <laughs> you got to wonder who names the poor fudge family, you know. Or our son, Draco. How do you do? How do you do, says fudge, you know. Allow me to introduce you to Mr. O'Blunt, and you can't say the Bulgarian minister of magic's name. And then we're told it was a tense moment. Because Fudge introduces Arthur Weasley. Mr. Weasley and Mr. Malfoy looked at each other. Harry vividly recalled the last time they'd come face to face. When? Two years ago. Okay. At Flourish and Blotts. Mr. Malfoy's cold gray eyes swept over Mr. Weasley and then up and down the road. Okay. Good Lord, Arthur. What did you have to sell to get top seats in the top to get seats in the top box. Surely your house wouldn't have fetched this much. Fudge, notice, not listening, says, Lucius has just given a very generous donation. Contribution to St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries, Arthur. He's here as my guest. So, to become a guest of the Minister for Magic, what do you do? Yeah. Donate money. Sound like anything? Sound like politics? Whether in the UK or in the US, doesn't really matter. Pay for play kind of mentality. Arthur, how how nice. Okay. Ron. You gotta just love Ron for seeing straight through to the essence of things and putting it in nice little short pithy phrases. Why? Because Ron's not an intellectual. He can't think of big words. Slimy gets. <laughs> okay? So, we see the Vila come out. We see the Quidditch World Cup. All of which we're going to skip. And we get the dark mark. Okay? It's now evening. Sky's dark. They're inside their tent, getting ready for bed. And Mr. Weasley comes in, tells them, get up, get up, hurry up. Out. Okay. And we're told, page 119, they see fires burning, and Harry and Ron see people running off into the woods, fleeing something that was moving across the field toward them, something that was emitting odd flashes of light and noises like gunfire. Crowd of wizards, tightly packed, moving together with wands pointing straight up, was marching slowly across the field. They're holding their wands straight up because what is up? 
the Roger, excuse me, the Roberts family. Mr., Mrs., and I think two children. High above them, floating along in midair, four struggling figures were being contorted into grotesque shapes. Right? So Harry, Ron, and Hermione go off to the woods. And Harry recognizes Mr. Roberts, the campsite manager up there. He sees one of the marchers below flipped Mrs. Roberts upside down with his wand. Her nightdress fell down to reveal voluminous drawers, and she struggled to cover up as the crowd below her screeched and hooted with glee. Ron, that's sick. Okay. So they go off into the woods, and they see the dark mark get created. And notice, just before all the wizards who apparate around Harry, Ron, and Hermione do the stunning spell, who gets them to duck? Harry does. And how does he get them? Does he just say duck and he's down and they're standing? He pulls them down. Just like in the first, first book, he stops Malfoy from going on into danger. Okay? This is Harry being good in a clutch situation. This is Harry thinking on his feet. Put an exam in front of him, he's going to get a C or so. Okay? Put him in a dangerous situation, he's going to come out alive. All right? So, we hear all the discussion. We find out, you know, Barty Crouch is one of two people in that clearing who really has proven his bona fides, his good faiths to everybody in the wizarding community about why he would not be somebody to conjure the dark mark. We don't know why until a little bit later. So they go off back to their tent. And Harry and Ron and Hermione want to know what's going on. Page 142. Okay, what is the dark mark? I mean, physically, describe it. It's a skull with a snake coming out of the mouth. Right? So, 142, Ron asked, I, I don't get it, it's just a shape. In other words, oh, should I go there? It's just a flag. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a sign, a symbol, thinking of the NFL protests. Ron, you know who and his followers sent the dark mark into the air whenever they killed. In other words, the symbol right, has what? It has some real world tangible connection. See that word symbol. We kind of tend to think, well, it just means it stands in and represents something. No. See, this part means with, and this is the idea or content of it. You know, Freud once said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes, also according to Freud, the cigar is not just a cigar, it's a phallic symbol. Okay? In both cases, when it becomes a symbol, it becomes physically tied to. See, this word is the opposite of that. But we don't use that on its own. What do we do? We say diabolic or diabolic goal. That always means what? <coughs> yeah, it never means good. It no, never means, oh, those nuns, they came up with a diabolical plan to help the poor. <laughs> Kill them all. You know, that was the to feed them. Kind of no, you don't do that. Okay? So the the image in the sky is directly tied to events. It's never done without killings. Right? Everyone's worst fear, Mr. Weasley goes on. The very worst. They're silent for a moment. Silence for a moment. And Bill mentions the Death Eaters. Harry, Death Eaters? Well, golly gee, Mr. Bill, what are Death Eaters? Like he never picked up a book about... So they explain... They mentioned they saw Draco in the woods. They assumed Lucius was probably out there. 
And Harry says, I'm, time out. I, I, I don't understand something. I mean, what's the point? What was the point of having the Roberts up in the air like that? Mr. Weasley. The point? Harry, that's their idea of fun. Half the muggle killings back when you know who was in power were done for fun. Hey, let that sink in. He probably had a few drinks tonight, couldn't resist reminding us that some of them are still at large, nice little reunion. Right? So this is how people, dark wizards, get their jollies. Real world comparisons? Oh yeah. A lot of sickos get their jollies a variety of ways, you know. People bring their cats in on Halloween, and not just black cats, all cats. Why? Because there's wackos out there who do unnatural things to cats on around before and after Halloween, okay, or other animals. Or candy for kids. So they keep talking, and Hermione's like, but who would have conjured the dark mark? I mean, if they did it, are they showing support for the Death Eaters or trying to scare them away? Good question. Mr. Weasley, your guess is as good as ours. And the result of those events at the Quidditch World Cup become the substance of the next chapter. Mayhem at the ministry. What is the mayhem? The reporter wrote an article about it and mentioned, I think it's Arnold Weasley, gets the name wrong, right? Who said some things, and what happens within the Weasley family? Tension, why? Because Percy said, yeah, well, you know, Dad shouldn't have done anything without speaking to his head of department. Does he have a head of department? If I remember correctly, there's only two people in there. And we're going to meet the other person in the next book. And the guy's nearly dead. I mean, literally almost unliving. Okay? What's the real mayhem? Well, there are death eaters walking. And they're not supposed to be, right? Where are the death eaters all supposed to be? They're supposed to be locked up. There's not supposed to be this kind of problem. Right? So we get introduced, page 151, to the Weasley clock. It's just a little throwaway kind of decoration and comment. But Harry likes this grandfather clock. Completely useless if you wanted to know the time, but otherwise informative. It had nine golden hands, two for the parents, seven for the children. Each of them engraved with one of the Weasley family's names. No numerals, but there are locations about the clock face. Home, school, work, but there's also traveling, lost, hospital, prison. Why in the world would you have a clock that says prison on it? Are you saying something about your family? Well, okay, friend George. <laughs> Percy, possibly. And then also mortal peril. Um, we'll pick up with Aboard the Hogwarts Express on Thursday. So I, I only got us through part of our wrong third. <laughs> we'll have to go much further next time. So if we have a quiz next week, 